Hello and welcome to your Lecture 2 Skill Check. Today we're going to look at two things. First, we're going to look at constructing a confidence interval for a population mean when the population standard deviation is known. And then the other scenario is constructing an interval when that standard deviation is unknown. And what's the difference between the two, you may ask? Well, in the first case, we're going to use a Z table. In the second case, we're going to use a t-table. So let's dig in. So here, look, y follows some distribution. It has a mean, it has a standard deviation. If that population standard deviation is known, then if we take our sample mean and we standardize it in the usual way, here we're standardizing standardizing by dividing by the standard deviation of the mean, then this standardized value will be approximately normal in distribution with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. In other words, this standardized value will be approximately z in distribution. It follows then that the confidence interval that we can build from the sample mean is just built in the normal way. We have our sample mean plus or minus a margin of error. And that margin of error is a function of your z-score, your critical value for that level of confidence. Uh, and then here it's the standard deviation of the mean. So all of this, of course, provided the conditions for the central limit theorem hold. We need to consider those conditions whenever the distribution for the individual measurements is not normal. The basic conditions are we need our observations to be independent of each other and we need the sample size to be large enough to make this normal approximation. So that's the case when the standard deviation for the population is known. Now what happens if this sigma is unknown? Well now, it's when we, when we, we're still going to standardize in the same way. But when we do so, there's one big difference. We're going to be dividing by the standard error of the sample mean instead of the standard deviation. The standard error, of course, is an estimate of the standard deviation of the sample mean, where we use the sample standard deviation instead of sigma because sigma is unknown. And so when you do that, this value is no longer z instead it follows a t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom in approximation, right? So here, the same way as before, we need to appeal to the central limit theorem to say that this value, this standardized value, is approximately t in distribution. And so here, the confidence interval, now, really, the only difference is the margin of error. Instead of being a function of a z-score, it's a function of a t-score of a critical value for the given level of confidence. And then instead of here multiplying by the standard deviation of y bar, it's the standard error of y bar. Conceptually, everything else is the same. And as before, certain conditions must hold. The conditions for the central limit theorem must hold if this distribution is either unknown or it's not normal. So again, as long as the observations are independent of each other and the sample size is big enough, then this will be a good approximation. So that is the theory. Um, now, I want to emphasize the relationship between a t-distribution and a normal distribution. So here on this diagram, the solid blue line is a t-distribution when the degrees of freedom is 2. The dashed line is the normal distribution. And what you'll notice here very clearly, the t distribution is a bit shorter and it's a bit wider than the normal distribution. It has heavier tails compared to the normal distribution. And why is that? That's because when we standardize using a standard error, because this standard error is an estimate, using that estimate introduces more uncertainty. And the more uncertainty you have in your test statistic, the wider its distribution will be. And so that explains it. Now, if the sample size, as the sample size gets larger, this t-distribution will move closer and closer to a normal distribution. And so 
when sample sizes are in the hundreds, the T distribution and the normal distribution are almost the same. So that's the theory. Now let's get to the questions. So for the first one, here we're looking at a company that makes batteries for watches. The engineers claim that the mean lifetime for one of their batteries is 4,500 hours with a standard deviation of 350 hours. So we're working with a known standard deviation. We already know we're going to be using a Z statistic. Now to test this claim, the plant manager takes a random sample of 60 batteries every month. So let's suppose the sample mean lifetime for November was 4,637 hours. Let's construct a 95% confidence interval for the population mean lifetime, assuming the population standard deviation is 350. So, here the population standard deviation is known. And so the confidence interval is computed using a Z value, a Z critical value for the level of confidence that we're looking for. And it's also calculated using that known standard deviation. So here we have a sample mean, we have our population standard deviation and our sample size. If we want a 95% confidence interval, we need to pick a critical value of 1.96. So let's first calculate the margin of error. That's this part of the confidence interval. So that margin of error, we're going to take the Z value, the critical value for a 95% confidence interval, and multiply by the standard deviation of the sample mean. So it's 1.96, that's the critical value, 350 for sigma, and the sample size was 60. We get a margin of error of just, just about 88 or 89 hours. Now to calculate the bounds of the interval, we just need to calculate the upper and lower bounds. We're going to take the sample mean plus or minus that margin of error. And so the lower bound is the sample mean minus the margin of error. The upper bound is the sample mean plus the margin of error. And so we get these two values. So let's interpret. Here's a little picture of our confidence interval. And one thing we notice pretty quickly is that the engineers claim that the mean lifetime of the battery is 4,500 hours, but this value falls outside the confidence interval. So what does that suggest about the mean battery lifetime for the month of November? Well, we can say that we're 95% confident that the population mean lifetime for batteries made during November is within this interval. And since 4,500 is not within this interval, we conclude that there is evidence that the population mean was greater in November than what was expected by the engineers, right? So this was expected by the engineers, and the data is indicating that the true value is somewhere in this region bigger than the 4,500 hours. Good. Second question. A random sample of 40 families in Nova Scotia had a mean of 3.2 children per family with a standard deviation of 0.97. Notice here we're given a sample standard deviation. Nowhere in sight can you find a population standard deviation. What does that tell you? We need to transition from using a Z st statistic to using the t-statistic. So we're going to construct a 95% confidence interval for the mean number of children for all Nova Scotian families, and then we're going to determine whether or not 3.0 is a plausible value for that population mean value. So again, the population standard deviation is unknown. And so the confidence interval for the mean we're going to take the sample mean plus or minus this margin of error. And now the margin of error is computed using a critical value that we'll take from a T table. And here we have the standard error of the sample mean. So we need to figure out what that critical value is. Notice the sample size is 40. 
And so the degrees of freedom for the t-statistic is 39. So let's go to the table. So here we have our t-table, and we notice that 39 degrees of freedom does not appear on this table. And so what we have to pick is a degree of freedom that is as large, sorry, as close as possible to the value we need without going over. And so we have to pick 35. So for a 95% confidence interval, we pick 35 degrees of freedom, and we can see that our critical value is 2.030. Now, just, just to put this into context, if we were using a z-table, then the critical value for a 95% confidence interval would be 1.96. Notice that this value is just a little bit bigger. And why is that? It's, again, because the t-distribution is a little bit wider than our z-distribution. And here, the degrees of freedom is fairly large, and so the difference is not very big. So in any case, we're going to use 2.03 .3 for our critical value. So we're going to start by calculating our margin of error. That's this part. The margin of error is the critical value multiplied by the standard error of the sample mean. So 2.03 came from our t-table. 0.97 was given as the sample standard deviation dividing by the square root of the sample size, and we get 0.3113. There's our margin of error. Now we just calculate the bounds, so we're going to take the mean value plus or minus our margin of error. So the mean value minus the margin of error, that gives us a lower bound, plus the margin of error gives an upper bound. We get these bounds. So let's interpret. Here's our upper and lower bound. And what do we notice? We notice that the value that we were asked about is inside this interval. And so what can we say? We are 95% confident that the mean number of children per family in Nova Scotia is within this interval. And 3.0 children per family is plausible because it's within the interval. And therefore, yeah, we can say it could be that the true average is 3.0 children per family. But on the other hand, any value within this interval, we would say is a plausible value for the true mean. And, and that's it. So thank you for watching this. I hope it was helpful. Um, I'll say bye. Bye-bye.